So you have a ton of properties, 30, over 30 properties on Furnish Finder. Uh, what have you found is the benefit of having so many properties on the site and having them spread out around the Austin area? So I just want to say that we do multiple, multi-pronged marketing on our properties, but and we measure how um, our advertising efforts are doing. And we feel that Furnish Finder is an excellent site for us, just so you know. And I, it, it always puzzles me because I sometimes see people commenting that they're not getting bookings off of Furnish Finder. And that, that does puzzle me because we find it really works well. Um, what I will say is when you have more properties up on the site, uh, there's a thing that I, I call it cross-marketing. But basically, the more properties you have, the more, the more inquiries you're going to generate. And let's say you have a property on Furnish Finder that just happened to already book, and you still have the listing there. So someone now hits on that one, and you're talking to that person, and you realize after talking to them that maybe a different one of your properties might work. So that happens to us all the time. Welcome to The Landlord Diaries, where we talk about midterm rentals and the opportunities behind them. We'll share landlord stories, talk about maximizing investment potential, and discuss how to live the very best landlord life. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Furnished Finder, the leader and largest online marketplace for midterm rentals. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoy our content. We are here with another great episode of The Landlord Diaries. It's your host team, Kelly Bailey and Katie Lyon. And today is a special treat. It's someone I admire very much and hope to one day be able to work with in the midterm rental space. Tell us about Julie, Katie. So Julie is amazing. She's in Austin. She's a realtor, a broker, an investor herself. She works as a property manager and a co-host for like 43 other properties or some crazy number like that. So she's very, very informed. She's very experienced and educated. And Julie for me is just a great example of people within the midterm rental industry because she doesn't gatekeep her information or her advice or her experience, which you and I get to see every single day when we record these episodes. Um, and we're just so happy to share it with, with all of you because that's not always the norm, right? But it's everyone here is, is here to make themselves the best landlord and business owner they can be, whether you have one property or a hundred and to also help others because when this entire industry gets better, we all get better. So it was such a great conversation. She got so many good nuggets. We talk about everything from, um, if you need a property manager to the current market. Um, so please listen in, enjoy, and don't forget if you're enjoying, um, the content to please comment, like, subscribe, follow, you know, just hit all the buttons except the bad ones. So (laughs) sounds good to me. (laughs) Thanks guys. Julie Stokely runs a full service brokerage in the Austin, Texas area and is founder of Homebase ATX. Julie saw an increasing demand for a new level of corporate housing and relocation services in the growing city of Austin. Homebase ATX has become one of the most sought after teams of home relocation service providers and corporate leasing specialists in Austin. Julie has almost a decade of experience in the midterm rental space with over 50 midterm rentals. Julie, we are so honored to have you with us today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. And Julie, I think you became an investor before you got uh, your real estate license and became a broker. So tell us about your journey uh, to that led to where you are today. Sure. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I think I've always been a person who was fascinated by real estate. Um, even before I was in a position to buy real estate when I was younger, I just... Um, you know, loved looking at homes, um, felt uh, drawn to different architecture. And um, we moved to Texas from Canada, actually, in the year 2000, and uh, purchased our first home in Austin as a, you know, primary home. 
Um, and then we had some Canadian investment money that we needed to remove from Canada and bring to the U.S. And I pestered my husband and I wanted to do real estate investing. And that's kind of how it started. And it was like not of interest to him in particular. Um, he was supportive, but I basically bought my first properties. And that was in 2007. And I've been going ever since. Um, basically more, more of a buy and hold type investor. Um, and uh, looking for properties that I felt had excellent locations, high rental demand, um, not so much a fixer upper, you know, a little bit of work, but more, more, more rental ready. So I got started on that and um, we were doing sort of 12 month typical stuff. And uh, I found that uh, there was a need for us to move into one of our rental homes because we were renovating. And while we were there, we furnished it and put really nice art in there. And when we left to go back to our house, I was like, hmm, maybe I will try and do a furnished rental. Let's see. And um, yeah, and I, um, I had already, so I had already done long-term rental. So I knew what the rate rates were for that. And I thought, let me see if I can increase my rent significantly by going this route. And there was a little bit of trial and error in finding the right platforms and ways to promote that. But the property was popular and that kind of got me onto like, wait a minute, this is a much better situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then I started to buy properties moving forward with the sort of goal of not doing the 12 month rental model anymore, doing midterm leasing. And honestly, at that time, very few people in Austin really knew about this, you know, and so I got a lot of calls and people that were interested in my properties, because I don't think there was a lot of other listings, you know, at that time. Yep. And I think that first rental that you got the light bulb moment of ding, this is my route, I am going to gear my business this way. I believe that was in 2012. And so you've been working in the corporate housing midterm rental uh, segment for over 10 years now. So what, what is your current portfolio look like? Uh, tell us all about um, home base ATX. Sure. So um, I became an agent uh, after investing for a while and I went into real estate full time. And um, within my first year as an agent, I was just working on my own properties at that time. And I approached my broker at the time and explained what I was doing and sought his approval to, um, you know, kind of do this on behalf of other owners. Because I can only make my portfolio a certain size if they are just my properties, as fast as I can buy them, right? Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that takes time, to be fair. Um, mm -hmm. So, but if I can represent other owners at, on leasing and managing their properties, I can grow much faster. Um, and so after getting approval from my broker, then I started adding properties much faster. So over the course of the last six years, we're now at almost 50 properties. Yeah, so it's grown pretty, you know, I think we started, as I had three or four of my own when I started out. So it's pretty big growth. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, and the segment's grown too, you know, along with me. I see now a lot more people trying their hand at this uh and you know seeking me out for advice and um you know i think that we're fortunate in that we were early innovators into the space so yeah. you have four properties that you own correct and the rest of the portfolio is properties that you co-host slash manage i know a lot of people kind of use those terms interchangeably so is that is that right yeah, so I okay. <clears throat> I actually have contracts with those owners to be their exclusive realtor for leasing those properties. And th these are owners who have all agreed to be in the midterm leasing space. So they understand that the properties need to be furnished and that the leases are not necessarily going to be 12 months. They're going to be shorter in length. Um, and they are trusting our team to basically identify the tenants and get the properties, you know, leased out for them. Yeah. So in that way, you're almost serving like you're helping them maximize their investment, right? Like they have this rental property and you're helping them say like, okay, like 
we can do more with this and and I know how. So you go from being just kind of a transaction-based relationship to like you're ongoing. And that's really cool. Um, okay, so in, in just over four years then, you've become one of the most sought-after teams for relocation service providers in Austin and corporate leasing in Austin. So how were you able to scale so fast and really make your presence known within that market? Because Austin is a large and competitive market. Yeah, it's very interesting to me. I think, first of all, I have to give credit to my team. Um, I, After doing this for about a year and a half, I realized this is not a one-man show. And I had to start hiring good people to support me. Um, and I've got seven people now, so of course it didn't start that way, but I think, you know, uh, taking time to hire good people and train them, uh, in the systems, um, that, that I had been doing, but I needed to hand over to someone else, you know, to grow the company. So that's been huge. Um, I think I've had some supporters, uh, along the way, different brokers and agents who have come to know me and respect what I do, uh, send me referrals, which is wonderful, you know? One other main factor is, I don't know why this is true, but a lot of realtors shy away from leasing business. And they just want to focus on sales um, because they get bigger commissions. I mean, sorry, but, you know, that's that's their mindset. And I've never really um, been that kind of realtor. Uh, of course I do sales, but I've always been more about, like, what are what is the real estate need of my client at the moment? And how do I service that? And then if I show that I'm able to help them with that problem, most likely they're going to come to me with another concern or desire or goal. And you know what? That turns into sales too. But if you say, if the conversation starts with, I need to lease my house, and I say, sorry, I don't do leasing, there's no relationship. You know, so I just very, so I just very early on took a different mindset to most of my peers who just are chasing after sales. And as a result, there hasn't been a ton of other people who have come into my space. To be fair, I think that's great. That's actually, we, one, our very first investment property was in Florida. um, And our realtor then became our property manager and leasing agent because in that state, the property management, at least for that property was very hands-on. We do all our other properties long distance, but this one was with the weather and the environment, like we needed someone there. Um, and now we're actually doing a seller finance deal to sell the property to her daughter, who's also on her <laughs> team. So it's like come full circle. It's like she helped us get it. And now we're like, okay, now you take it. so but yeah it's been it's been kind of this ongoing relationship but anything we need we haven't really seen her as just a realtor we've seen her as kind of our our partner and our resource in all of this so I think that's very very smart all right so how do you describe what a corporate rental is to your clients either that you're you know explaining midterm rentals and kind of this strategy to or who maybe are are brand new to it how when they when you you know when you're when you're selling them on it and letting them know how it would work if you're like okay we're going to do some corporate rentals some midterm rentals furnished monthlies they say what's that what what do you let them in on Today's episode is proudly sponsored by Furnished Finder, the ultimate platform for hassle-free midterm rentals. Whether you're a seasoned landlord or just getting started, Furnished Finder has everything you need to find your next tenant. With Furnished Finder, you can say goodbye to booking fees, markups, and commissions, and hello to direct bookings. If you're ready to experience all the benefits renting your property for 30 days or more, head over to furnishedfinder.com where you can list your property for one low annual price. We make it easy to get started. It means different things to different people. And it, and if you don't define it, they become confused or expect that you're doing something different. I, I find that people very easily differentiate between an unfurnished 12-month rental, you know, you're not doing that. They understand that part. But where they get confused is they think you're doing an Airbnb or something 
like that. Like it's a short-term rental. I get that a lot. Oh, you're doing short-term rentals, right, Julie? And I'm like, no, actually, I'm not really doing that. Um, we don't do anything less than 60 days, and most of ours are more than 90 days. So that's not really a short-term rental. And so what I try to explain to them is that we're working with people who are going through um, either a work contract or some kind of life transition. Um, what that might be, it could be building a custom home, going through a renovation, relocating into Austin, um, going through a divorce. I mean, that's not the nicest situation, but, you know, those people need good housing options while they're figuring things out. Um, and so I try to explain it's for transition, but why would you do this? I think there are a number of reasons as an investor to do it. I mean, obviously, the financials are generally better. You know, the rents are higher. Uh, but I also try to explain to them that I believe because you're having more touches on the property when you come in and change it from one tenant to the next and you get to bring a turnover team in there and take a look at it, I believe those properties stay in better condition over time. If you have a, a long-term tenant in your property for two or three years, and they could be a great tenant, the truth is that you're not going in there as much. You really don't actually know the condition unless they're very actively reporting it to you. And so when I used to do that model, I'd come in and sometimes it would be like, oh my goodness, there's so much to do here. <laughs> it's, right. kind of stress it's kind of stressful. And now maybe I would have done that repair six months ago and it wouldn't have been this bad, you know? And so it's much more preventative maintenance. And um, I also tell people like, if you ever want to sell this property, this furniture can stay in here and be your staging. So it already looks fabulous. You can get the listing up really fast. It's great. You know, so I think it maintains the value of their property better because the condition stays higher. And then I also do think, I also do think, just based on the pure economics, that they're probably getting a higher quality tenant as well. You know, and that, and that matters because, I mean, it's not a proven fact, but I do think a higher quality tenant also means less, less drama, less damage to your property, you know. So there are a lot of advantages to it. Um, also, I do now, I have an emerging group uh, in the portfolio of part-time um, part time owners. What I mean by that is that they want to use their properties for a few months a year because maybe they do spend time in Austin sometimes. But they also want to have a good tenant in there when they're not there. And so a long-term rental does not allow you to do that. You, you, you can't. I mean, you're, you'd be forced to break the lease. Yep. This, this model allows you the flexibility to say, hey, I want three months a year to be in Austin, and then Julie, can you lease it out for me in the other months? I always explain like it doesn't quite work, always line up perfectly, but yes, we can try to maximize out your vacancy and get you a tenant in the other part of the year. That's a great point because that's one of the, uh, so like an associate here on the pickleball court in Austin was that we were talking about that and they were like, we live half our year in Colorado and half our year here. And we really want someone to take care of our property while it's furnished so that, you know, we don't have to worry about that when we're moving six months out of the year. And you were the one I referred them to. I don't know if they ever called or got set up with you or not, but that's, I mean, that totally makes sense that people are real, especially uh, retirees. They love that model, right? Where you can yeah. live half and half uh, in different areas. Yeah. Or the empty nesters that are trying to figure out where they're going to retire and they want to go visit mm -hmm. different places. And, you know, when you come back to the house, you want it furnished, right? If you're yeah. coming back for three months, coming back for three <laughs> months, you don't have time to put all the furniture back in. You just want to show up. Yep. So those ones, we have a little bit more logistics. We have to work on things like owner's closets and what needs to be in the property, what needs to be removed and all of that. It's a bit more complex. I was actually talking to a friend recently and she's she's an only child and she lives out here in Denver and her parents live in the Midwest and they're, they were always flying back and forth to visit. But my friend's house was pretty small. Like she lives in like proper Denver where like you're not going to get a, a large house. <laughs> um, and, and they were renting hotels and finally they bought a condo to stay at and they furnished it all. And then I'm like, what are you doing? You know, when you come for 
a month in December, what are you doing with your other house? And they're like, well, we're just leaving it there. I'm like, what are you doing with the condo when you're not here? And it was like a light bulb went off. Like, oh, we can, <laughs> we can, we can put someone in here and help cover the expenses. And their mindset was, we're going to have this second property anyway for personal reasons, right? Whether we cover even, like, whether we make a profit or not is, is, just would be just gravy on top of it all and would help with, you know, maintenance and travel expenses back and forth and whatnot. But they were just so thrilled that there was like, oh, there's something I can do with this. It's like, yes, <laughs> and please do, you know, you can make yeah. it so someone else has a great place to stay too. So it's, it is amazing, especially when, you know, you get those second homes or whatnot, you can, you can do something with them. Yeah, and there are people that leave Austin in the summers a lot because it's hot here, but they have every intention of still living here. They just they just want to rent it out for three or four months a year. And you know what? They're going to go traveling, so if they get some rent, then that helps pay for the traveling, you know? Hey, landlords. Are you ready to level up your rental game and simplify your midterm rental business? Well, get ready to meet your new best friend, KeyCheck. KeyCheck is your all-in-one solution for stress-free property management. With tenant-paid screenings, online rent payment processing, custom lease creation, and a suite of incredible landlord tools, you'll wonder how you ever lived without it. No more chasing down checks or sifting through piles of applications. KeyCheck helps you organize and manage all things landlording in a simple and efficient way. Make landlord life a breeze with KeyCheck, the game changer for modern property owners. Visit KeyCheck.com to unlock the power of stress-free property management and take your rental business to new heights. I'm always saddened when I hear someone say, especially professionals in the space, say, oh, I've got a ton of furnished rentals, but I just want to try out the site. And so they'll put one property on Furnished Finder. I'm like, but you're really doing yourself a disservice by only putting one because you're not getting those tenant leads and getting the variety of uh, map searches around your metropolitan area or you know if, if you have properties in multiple cities you know try out all those different cities so you have you know uh, a ton of properties 30 over 30 properties on furnish finder uh, what have you found is the benefit of having so many properties on the site um, and having them spread out around the austin area so I just want to say that we do multiple multi-pronged marketing on our properties, but and we measure how um, our advertising efforts are doing, and we feel that Furnish Finder is an excellent site for us. Just so you know, and I it it always puzzles me because I sometimes see people commenting that they're not getting bookings off of Furnish Finder, and that that does puzzle me because we find it really works well. Um, what I will say is when you have more properties up on the site, uh, there's a thing that I, I call it cross-marketing, but basically the more properties you have, the more, the more inquiries you're going to generate. And let's say you have a property on Furnish Finder that just happened to already book and you still have the listing there. So someone now hits on that one and you're talking to that person and you realize after talking to them that maybe a different one of your properties might work. So that happens to us all the time. So that's one of the reasons why we keep our listings active is we want those cross-marketing opportunities. We keep our calendars updated, that's important, but we also want to say, hey, yeah, you know what? That three bedroom, two bath house that you were asking about has actually booked now, or it's not available for the timing that you want it. It is available, but it's a month later but let me see if I can help you. I might have other properties. And I think that's a real advantage of having multiple properties up there. Yep, for sure. We had one in our Belton Temple area where Belton had been live for a couple years, but it wasn't available. And we were in the process of buying our Temple property, so it wasn't on the site yet. Well, because someone, you know, was able to use that cross-marketing and reach out about Belton, I was able to tell them about Temple. And rather than having to wait, 
you know, once we closed on the deal, we had a insurance company ready uh, with clients to move in. I think it was like within a week of closing. Uh, And they brought the furniture because we didn't have time to completely furnish it. So we had guests for a year in the home that we didn't even have to furnish the place until (laughs) one year later. It was amazing. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. We even have, we have three studio apartments all within two buildings, next door buildings. And these, they are essentially triplets. Two of them are exactly the same. The only difference between the two of them is the color of kitchen chair because the white ones were out of stock. The other ones, the layout is just like slightly different. And by slightly, I mean like the couch instead of over here is over here. Like you'd never know it. And I think most people would probably put up one listing, but we have all three up and I'm telling you it works so great because when people click on it, A, they're seeing our listing essentially three times right? So we are taking up a bigger space up the map and we're taking up more of those, more of those visuals. And also if someone clicks on it and it's not available for their dates, but then they click on my profile, they see that you're like, yes, I am a professional landlord, right? And, and that's one of mom and pops are fantastic. We absolutely love them. But if if one of the things that you are trying to advertise as a more professional landlord with a with a larger selection is that you have a larger selection, those people are never going to know it if you don't list those properties, right? It's also, you want to be able to cross market and say, look at this other listing I have, not let me tell you about another listing. Because if you're trying to refer to a property that's not on Furnish Finder, yeah. it can come off as very, very scammy, right? So we definitely don't encourage that. But, you know, you think about it and when you multiply it, yeah, like it's it's three times more expensive to put up three studios than one. However, the benefits I get from that are huge and it's still the same price per unit. It's so inexpensive. So it's just, I think it just frames you, anyone who, anyone who has multiple properties and isn't taking up their fair share of that search page, like you're missing out. And we wanted to circle back and speak to something Julie was uh, referencing is, you know, if you're on the Furnish Finder Facebook group with the over 100,000 people in the group and you say, oh, Furnish Finder is not working for me. What we find is when people, you know, uh, say those things and they actually reach out to customer service uh, for help. A lot of times it's their calendars outdated, they don't have professional photos, and they're not very active in their tenant leads or in their messaging. Uh, And Furnish Finder was made to be uh, a proactive site. We want you guys to be able to do business your way and connect with possible tenants, but you can do your screenings, you can have multiple applicants, you can use your direct booking platform if you'd like. For if you don't have an opportunity for that, we've got our sister company, KeyCheck, which has everything you need once someone says yes. It has the tenant screenings, state-specific leases with e-signature, and rent payments, and er- two of those are free to you, and uh, the tenant pays for uh, the fees and then the leases is the only one that you would sign up for and choose the best fit and it's very affordable. Yeah, I always tell people I'm like if if you're if you're not getting the results you want on Furnish Finder, you know, go back, look at the resources because it is meant to be and I'm I'm using an analogy here because and my husband calls me the queen of analogies lately. I come up with some that are way worse than others, but I'm like Furnished Finder is a dating site, right? You're putting up your profile, you're putting your best foot forward, but you have to get on there and message some people and you have to schedule the date, right? Like we can't do that for you, right? This is it's a lead generation platform. It is different than all of the online travel agencies, the Airbnb, the Verbo, things like that. So you have to behave differently on it, right? Like you've got to get active and you've got to message, you've got to connect, you've got to interact, um, check your photos, check your pricing, all these things. Really make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. So Katie, all I right, think you're Julie. on to something. 
I think we need a swipe left, swipe right. If you swipe <laughs> left, it automatically connects with your with that host. <laughs> I will take that up the chain, Kelly. No promises. <laughs> No promises, but that would be kind of fun because I don't know about you guys, but sometimes if I'm like, I can't fall asleep, I'm like, I think most people like scroll Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to look on Zillow for a while. Yes. (laughs) That's probably all three of us. (laughs) Even if I don't have any money at the time, we're like in no position for the next property. I'm like, oh, I just just need to scroll a little. (laughs) So true. what's going on out there. Yeah. 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 All right, um, Julie. So you, we've noticed that a lot of your properties on Furnish Finder have a 90-day minimum. Um, we should add in here, because it's an interesting stat, that the average stay for a Furnish Finder guest is somewhere between 90 and 100 days. Um, but we have a 30-day minimum, and 30-day minimum is kind of what gets you from short-term to mid-term, right? That's kind of the, the soft cutoff there. So tell us your your thought behind a 90-day minimum instead of a 30. So I would say that most of our owners prefer that. And, you know, since we're representing other owners, their interests are important to us. Um, We will ask them to be more flexible if we're if we're finding that the property is not getting enough leads. We will ask them to consider a 60 day. Uh, But Keep in mind, because they have a representative helping them book, there is a fee for, for, for our services, right? And that fee is incurred when we find them a new tenant. So the reality is that they don't want uh, to be paying that fee every month, you know? So our model is a little different. Um, and I would say our average day actually is more like five months. Um, so we're just kind of working more on that three to six month group. Um but I wouldn't say that we rule out completely the 60-day stay. We have had those. They require owner approval. They're usually given They're usually given in those situations, for example, with the part-time owner who wants to use the property or where we've had a slower time period and the property is not booking and they would consider a shorter stay because they just don't want vacancy, so to speak. So, But that's just been the wheelhouse that we're in. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I, I assume we would probably get more leads if we took it down to 60 days. But again, the owners might not, they don't always appreciate having that much turnover, because that could be like six short leases a year. And maybe they don't want maybe they don't want to pay turnover fees. And every time that happens, you know, and that's the other, like the leases, like the leads have to work for you, right? So I think I think you have a good point there. Now, you have a lot of tenants that re- that renew and I think that's also pretty typical within midterm rentals. I know Kelly has that um I find that I have that um, I don't get it too much. You don't. I think mm-hmm. it's I mean, I think the the two ends of the perspe- of the spectrum of midterm tenants and this is a total guess, you guys. Okay, this is not backed by hard data. But if you go to like the travel nurses, traveling medical professionals, a lot of times they'll renew because they start on a 13-week contract and a lot of times they have the opportunity to renew if the hospital has the need and they have found a match within that individual, right? On the flip side, if you're housing insurance claims, relocations, remodels in those larger properties, when was the last time anything in construction got done on time? Right. Yeah. So you're okay, getting a you're lot right. of extensions I there. I get right? a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, so you guys experience a lot of extensions as well, is correct? Okay. And do they all kind of fit into those categories? Uh, yeah, we actually keep stats on that too. Um, and we're about 55% of the time they're extending beyond their original uh, and I think one of the ways that we're having that is that we are proactively asking fairly early on, about about four weeks before checkout, we're proactively reaching out to say, what are your plans? And if you want to stay, we'll make sure we hold the property for you, you know? Um, and if they don't know their plans, it's okay, but that oftentimes triggers an extension, which is great. Um, and so, you know, for the most part, we want extensions, 
uh, that's a good thing, you know. Um, but there are situations where maybe the owner wants to use the property and we can't always offer that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's a, uh, so, so it's, you know, it's a short term mentality for an owner to look at it as, well, I'm only getting 60 days. I think that's a really, that's the wrong mindset because that's not typically how it washes out. Right. Yeah. The 60 days often turns into 90 or 120. I've definitely had people that have come in for three months and stayed 12. <laughs> so, you know, you just never know. And I mean, so I just tell people like, you're not going to complain if I bring you a six month lease, you know, that, you know, that, that you're very ha happy with that. But a, th but a three month can easily turn into a six month, by the way. So, so like, you just kind of have to be flexible. Yeah. You do. And a lot of these tenants get these changes last minute, right? Like a lot of times the hospital extensions, they come last minute or the, it's like construction, like, oh, I thought you were going to be done. Everything's on time. And then pff, nothing's done. On time. So it's, it's, we're in a midterm, but as far as booking, at, at least I've experienced this and I'd be curious what's happened for you guys. I get a lot of bookings and a lot of extensions last minute. Like, oh, hi, I'm looking for someone to somewhere to move in next week. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I can, sure. <laughs> a lot of times it's kind of short-term thinking. I will say uh, I like the 30-day the minimum, right? Or the 30-day thir the heads up. So it's like while last minute changes do occur, we always ask our guests to give us just a 30 day heads up. They can stay as long as they want. We just want to know 30 days in advance before you move out. And if during that time period, we don't have anyone yet and you need to change it again, then that's totally fine. Now we've got a new 30 days in place. So that has worked very well with us for the remodels and the home purchases and, you know, uh, building homes and, and those sorts of scenarios. And the best we've done yet is we're going to have a travel nurse family with us for probably by the end. Right now they're at over two years. I think they'll probably with, be <laughs> wow. with us somewhere between two to five years by the end. Now we did, we did make sure and work with them. Cause like you're saying, if you just, if you just shut down and say, no, we don't do that. We're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities. And this is a great family that not only uh, has been an awesome addition to our home, but we store our boat out there as well. And he's pretty savvy with boats. So if Dave ever has something that like goes wrong with the boat, uh, he'll typically give advice on, Hey, it's probably this blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's been really cool. And we just kind of negotiated and, and made a between midterm rental and long-term rental rate for them, uh, so that we didn't lose this wonderful family. Um, but one thing, Julie, that I think with, so many people think I don't need a property management company. I can do this myself. And if I do hire a property management company, I'm not going to see any cash flow. Uh, so why don't we talk to the appreciation versus the cash flow? And in our current market, how are your um, property management clients doing uh, with your corporate uh, rentals uh, that they own? Yeah, so I get two groups that do property management with me. They are typically people who start out working with me to buy the property and then we work the property management fee and leasing fees into their cash flow analysis from the beginning. So they already have their head wrapped around those numbers. Or I'll have people that'll bring me a property that had already been with a property management company or an Airbnb property management company because it was furnished and they were doing Airbnb and now they don't want to do that anymore. Um, so I would say a midterm rental property management is a lot less expensive than the Airbnb property management type stuff because they're turning it over all the time and it's very labor intensive. Um, I do get people that just want to use us for leasing services and that's okay too, but I do try to caution them. Here, here's my thoughts about that. Um, it's a more high touch model, right? Doing midterm rental than it is doing long-term rental. Um, you're asking them to pay more rent. They're going to expect you to be more attentive. Um, you're going to have to turn over the property more regularly. Uh, and when you turn it over, you need to present it well. So if you have time in your life and you're local and you can do those things, 
great, that's probably going to work out awesome. But if you're really busy in your other career and you don't have the time to do this well, um, you're going to frustrate the tenant. Um, and that's going to start to get weird, you know. Um, so I, I, and if you're not local, it's also very clunky too, because now you're relying on friends or contractors to be your eyes and ears. And sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. The other big part of this that people don't realize is until it becomes a problem is having a valid lease and having a property manager enforce that is huge when stuff goes wrong. What if they don't pay their rent on time or if they don't pay it at all? And you're not really, how, what do you do? You don't know. A property manager is trained to know what to do there, how to evict them, how to take them to court, how to fight for you. Okay, that's awful. You don't want to have to think about that, but this does happen sometimes. Um, also, what if they're just violating a provision in the lease and they're doing it constantly? Are you comfortable being the enforcer and going there and going there and dealing with that? A property manager is paid to do that, you know, and they have to do that for you. So I think there, you know, every, everything being good, we all think, okay, we can do that. We can property manage until things go wrong. And then it gets tricky. You can land yourself in a lawsuit very easily, and that's not what anyone wants. Um, so I do try to talk to people. They have the choice, of course, but I try to explain the pros and cons. Sure, you're going to save that property management fee, and you're going to be a little bit more profitable not having property management. I got it. I understand. But you're also taking on this extra responsibility. When the pipes burst at midnight, they're going to call you. Do you, will you answer? Do you want that call? <laughs> do you know what to do? Do you know what to do? And if you don't, they're going to call our team and we already have a list of contractors and maintenance manager on call. So for us to handle it, it's, it's a normal part of doing business. I think, I think it's important to also realize the type of property you have, right? If you have like if you're responsible for the outside of your property, if you have a big yard, if you have a pool, if you have things like that, the age of the property, right? If you have a brand spanking new condo and you're not responsible for anything outside of those four walls, that's a little bit easier. But I think even in the best case scenario where you're like, I got this, I can do all of it. You need to have a relationship with someone like Julie who if something goes wrong, you know, you can go to her and you can say like, hey, I have my lease from KeyCheck, so I know it's legally binding and all, all of, it checks all the right boxes. However, I'm in a pickle. Can you help me? And I'm sure, you know, people like Julie are responsible and responsive and, and you know, for a partnership fee or whatever it is, I'm sure you would be able to help people through that through that process. Um, but I just think it's important that even if you take the route of, I can do this, I can handle this, I got it all on my own, you still need to have a backup, right? Yeah, yeah. And you just want, hopefully, it won't go to the point where you're already into legal, legal stuff, and then it's a real estate lawyer that's helping you, you know, or, or a landlord tenant lawyer, you know, um, hopefully, you know, you don't wait too long to get advice. Um, it's really important when you're doing all of this investing and, and landlord uh, stuff to not get in over your head, right? To recognize what are my strengths? What do I know? What do I not know? And don't fake it, <laughs> you know, like, talk to other people, get advice. Even me, you know, I've been doing this a really long time. I have several good mentors. You have to have that, you know, and you shouldn't be afraid to talk to people and say, I want to run this by you. <laughs> here's what's, here's what's going on. And here's what I want to do. What do you think? And oftentimes our instincts are good. But without validating it, we also could have made a big mistake. You know, there's a lot of, that's another thing about using a realtor, right? We're trained. We have to take courses on all of the legislation out there. So we will know if we're doing something illegal or not. And we will that's good. definitely advise against it. Don't do it. Because <laughs> you know what? All it takes is that tenant to have some legal knowledge or someone in their family who's a lawyer. And all of a sudden, they're threatening to sue you. So I'm not trying to scare people, but this is the real world. I mean, there's a lot of fair housing and American Disabilities Act. There's a lot of laws out there that you have to yeah, actually be aware of, you know? 
one thing that I like uh, that you advertise and we talk about on the show as well is zero of ev- evictions, you know, for your corporate rentals. And that's pretty common because of the clientele that you're having come through. Uh, so I want to wrap up with one last piece of the conversation uh, from a broker realtor perspective of, uh, you know, for those of you that are more mom and pop operators out there or don't even have your first midterm rental yet, you know, y'all have heard me say many times, I view myself as a midterm rental enthusiast. I am so honored to be able to tell all of your stories around the country, uh, but I look forward to the opportunity of partnering with hopefully Julie or someone like Julie in the future around the the country uh, to help Dave and I grow our mindset because Dave and I think very small and our answers are exactly what Julie's saying. Oh, that pipe bursted. What are we going to do? Well, we haven't been great at like finding the right contractor that is our go-to person. AHS has been amazing for everything on the inside of our home. We love using the American Home Shield warranties on our houses. But what if something breaks on the outside or you need your siding redone, things like that? We haven't done a great job of building those relationships. And we did go shake somebody's pipe out uh, in one of our most recent freezes. They had no water. We didn't know what we were doing, but we spent two to three hours in the cold uh, where a professional probably would have come out and, you know, fixed it within 30 minutes. But we got it done. But it's not the best way to do business. And so, Julie, what are you seeing right now with our crazy market and our higher interest rates? What are some creative ways that people can still find great corporate rentals and midterm rentals in this market? I think you have to uh, consider uh, on the buying side what incentives you can get from the seller at the moment, right? So obviously people immediately go to price and they think about that as a negotiating. And of course it is, but it's so much more, right? Uh, You can now really negotiate a lot towards your closing costs. You can negotiate interest rate buy downs. New, New construction is offering all kinds of Uh, I mean, it's amazing in some areas what they're offering um, as far as not just, you know, interest rate, but, you know, cash at close and all of this factors into your return. Right. So and then I think working with a good realtor, you can also like look at certain repairs and have the seller either take those on or get concessions towards those. So you really are starting off with a property that doesn't have like a lot of headaches. Um, I also work with a really great lender here in Austin who, and I know this is not just in Austin, it's available in other areas, Um, but she does, um, you know, uh, remodeling in the loan, like rolled into the loan. So uh, the property's priced a little lower than their buy budget, but they want to put in a certain amount of equity into it, uh, remodeling to get it rental ready. That can all be part of the loan application. So just little things like that. So all of a sudden, the property that was off the table, now it goes back on the table. Um, So I think there's lots of things. I mean, it's not, this is not a robust real estate market. But you know what, most real real estate investors buy in these down markets, even with high interest rates, because they understand they can refinance the rate, but prices might not be this low again for quite some time. Mm-hmm. Most people are shying away like, oh my gosh, no, actually, if you're in a position, especially a cash buyer, like, you know, get in there. I'm sorry, but get in there. <laughs> you're a cash buyer, right? Because you don't have to worry about the interest rate. But most of us aren't cash buyers, and I get that. So it's a little bit less focus on cash flow right now for a year or two, and then we, then we get to refinance. And what we need to focus on right now is appreciation, because we're getting a good price, and that's going to go back up. You know, this this uh, time period that we're all in right now, we all know what's driving that. Um, and, you know, we don't have time to get into all of that on this program, but it's those conditions will change over time, you know? For sure. Well, let's let's transition a bit and really engage in the realtor side uh, as a broker Um of the conversation because many midterm rental investors do it all on their own. Now they're not necessarily 
purchasing their own properties. But the Bigger Pockets author, Sarah Weaver, Ziana McIntyre, you know, Bigger Pockets constantly educates on use an investor friendly agent for your purchases. And it's so valuable because if you're not an investor and an agent, you don't really understand the mindset of an investor as well. So let's get into some of those things that you explain very well about how valuable it is to have a realtor or a broker in your court uh, when you're choosing your next furnished rental or midterm rental property. Sure. I think uh, I'll talk initially just on the realtor in general and then maybe more specifically about an investor realtor because I think they're a little bit different. So all realtors are going to help you negotiate they're going to be able to look up the, the comps for the sales. If they know what they're doing, they can also look up the comps for like long-term rentals, all of that stuff. And that's very helpful, and you need to have that research. Um, where, you, where it changes a little bit is if you're working with an investor-friendly uh, realtor, meaning that they have done some investing, they, they have a math mindset, they think about what your goals are, um, then they can start to really break down your cash flow for you, what that's going to look like. If they know what they're doing, they should be able to look up appreciation rates in different areas and neighborhoods and compare those for you so you can see. And when I say appreciation rates, we're looking at historical data. Not We can't predict the future, right? But historical data can be very telling on how an area is performing. So we can do that for you. Um, in addition, we can look at things like capitalization rates, um, are, what's going to be your return on investment predicted, and then also historic, like after you've owned the place for a year, what's my return on investment, all of that kind of data. And I love math. <laughs> so <laughs> to me, I don't mind doing that. I think that's the exciting part about being an investor uh, is transforming properties and then also seeing the potential, what that's doing for your net worth. Because ultimately, that's why we're in this, in this, is that we want to, at some point down the road, build our net worth to some point that gives us financial freedom, whatever that looks like. Financial freedom might be that you keep working, but you don't have to keep working. You know, that's, that's awesome, you know. And passive income, I believe, is part of that. You know, there are other ways to invest, certainly, but real estate provides a really powerful way to invest because when you leverage a lender's money, your money you're growing your returns faster. Uh, and I have a whole like model thing that I show to people on that because it's sort of obvious to me. But then I realized we're not really educated on this when we're growing up and we don't we don't get to take a course on on this. Right. So and when I show that to people, they're all like, no one's ever showed me this. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't know about this. Uh, and then I get some investors that come and they're very savvy and um they already know how to work these numbers and they just like working with me because I understand how to do it, too. You know, uh, but yeah, I think it matters a lot because I'm what it does is it makes me very uh, honest, because if I'm going to run numbers ahead of time and you're going to buy that property, you're going to I'm going to sort of feel a sense of ownership in your purchase that things will work out, you know, having provided the guidance. Yeah. And a lot of agents will say, OK, I work with investors. Sure. I'm, I, I, I'll no, I'll do that. But they actually really don't have that background, the math background. Yeah. So it's not the greatest. You know, like, I'm not saying that they didn't pick a good property. They might, but they're not doing as much due diligence. Right. And to dive into that a little deeper, I, the ethical side of real estate is super important to you. So, like, wh how what where does it cross the line sometimes? Like, wh wh how is that? Let's just hear more about the ethical side of the business. Sure. I mean, I think that uh, for me, I have to be very careful to give information, but also in a context and make sure people understand that's not a guarantee. Past performance is not a guarantee of future performance. It's an indicator. Um, and so I have to be really cautious about that and make sure what I'm saying, if they're misinterpreting it, that I correct that. You know, um, I also will say that um, if if I feel like I'm working with someone on the other side of the table, an agent who has poor ethics, or if I get wind of the fact that something might be wrong with this property, 
um, or we're not getting the full story, things look kind of fishy, you know, I will definitely uh, talk to my client and we'll consider pulling off that deal if it's fishy enough. Because it's not good if you feel like the other side, the seller side, is not representing things well. This is the beginning when they're supposed to be on their best behavior. <laughs> right. You know, and if they're not, something's not right about that. And there's other properties, you know what I mean? You kind of sometimes you have to go, oh, that was a near miss. Let's move on, you know. So I would rather do that and not get the sale because it's right for my client, you know. And don't get emotionally invested, right? And sometimes that's hard for us investors because especially in today's market, it can feel like oh, I've been looking for a property that can hit my target numbers for so long. And then you finally find one and you're like, oh, finally. And you're like, it's it's so great. I found it. And then something can go wrong, either ethically or like a vibe or something at an ex inspection and it can turn it all around. And Sometimes you can try to force it to make it work, but it's like, no, this is just not meant to be. Um, but I want to talk about some of your successes as well. You've got a lot of case studies on your website. So why don't you kind of give us an overview of one of the case studies that you've done with um, one of your clients and kind of tell us how it went and how it turned out. Yeah, one of my favorite ones, I have an investor. He's based in California. He's bought several uh, multifamilies with me. And um, we targeted Northwest Austin and Central Austin for his purchases. And we targeted duplexes that were originally um, investor held long term rentals um, that were in great locations, but very tired on the inside. They they were good floor plans, but the things were dated and they had been long term rentals for a while. And so they were just kind of, you know, a little bit beaten up. And so we bought one in uh, Northwest Hills that was, he spent, I want to say 670 on both sides, the whole, whole property. And each side was renting out for um, about 1700 a month. And it had active tenants in one side and then another lease that was almost up. Um, so we acquired those tenants, and then the one that was almost up, um, we turned that into a midterm rental after those folks left. And then a year later, we turned the other side into a midterm rental. On each side, we did about eight to 10,000 in light remodeling. So like, just kind of give it a spruce, right? Get it looking better, get the furniture in. And we're now, we've actively been leasing both of those now for our, over two years, and they're consistently at thirty three to thirty five hundred a month. So on each on each side. So I mean that's if you do it right, I mean that's the power of midterm versus long term. That's a huge difference. And those are very popular properties because of the neighborhood they're in. Um, and I think they just needed someone to come in and see that property in a different light, give it a different vision. Does it have to be tired? Does it have to be? a long-term du du uh, rental just because it's a duplex. These, these both have huge yards, you know. Um, so that's a really great one. And he also purchased an, a more modern duplex with me in central Austin, and we did something similar. We didn't have to do remodeling on that one, but similar thing where we had long-term tenants and we, they moved out and we were able to increase the rent. I think in that case it was 1900 and now it's around 36 $3,700. So... That's a These great were, case study. Example. Yeah, that's a really good one. They're not all that mm -hmm. strong. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of times they're single family, so you don't get as much of a boost, right? And the thing I love about that one, I talked to him, is that you know eventually he doesn't want to sell those. They're they're cash flowing really well, but eventually, if he does want to sell them, we could split those and sell them separately too, and they'd be worth a lot more, you know. So his little six seventy five one. Uh, the valuation I did for him about six months ago, it's worth over 900 now. Wow. So it's done good, you know. It it was fantastic. This has been everything I hoped uh, the interview would be. We really appreciate you. Furnish Finder appreciates you. Uh, if someone wants to connect uh, and ask you further questions or look is potentially interested in investing in the Austin area, how should they connect with you? Thank you for asking that. We do have a website. Um, it's www.homebaseatx.com. 
and on there are various team members and how to reach them. Um, I'm on there, other members of my team. I personally am not big enough company yet. I take direct calls from owners that are interested in what we do, so they can reach out to me personally. Um, I also have a team member named Sage who uh, kind of takes inquiries on our properties and would be happy as well. So, yeah, please, like, reach out anytime. I, I love connecting with um, other owners who are trying to do this. I recognize not everybody who speaks to me wants me to work for them. Sometimes they just need me to help with, you know, a little bit of direction or guidance, and I'm always happy to help with that. Well, thank you, Julie, so much for being with us. We've heard another great episode on the Landlord Diaries. If you're enjoying our show, please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share it with a friend. We, you know, there's lots of great real estate investment opportunities out there. uh, And it's a great strategy to really build your generational wealth, right? So guys, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.